um, with misuse of implants. And I hear the, my consultant saying, uh, sometimes when you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. And um, uh, I'm telling you this story simply because since I, uh, I'm thinking whatever successful a procedure may be, it's successful for the correct indication, but it cannot be successful for every person. And, um, and um, the, the word of a size that fits all um, uh, doesn't uh, 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 fit in orthopedics. I think uh, we have to be uh, accurate and, um, and uh, uh, correct in our indication. And I think the overall, what we're talking about is loosening of tibial tray. This is the whole debate. And uh, when we talk about loosening of tibial tray, perhaps we should look at alignment, cementation, and implant. We'll be looking at drawbacks of using a stem. And um, uh, finally, we'll talk about the correct indication for using the stem, which is the complex primary knee. Uh, we know that loosening is the first cause of revision in different literature search, and this is the uh, NGR um, uh, data. 2020 lysis and aseptic loosening. But I would like you to look at this graph as well. Because the more constrained the implant that's used in primary knee, the higher the incidence of loosening and revision in the postoperative survival and outcome. Um, effect of coronal alignment on survival, we have a very clear evidence that various malalignment postoperatively is one of the uh, common indications for early aseptic loosening and that's why we should focus on how to align our knees rather than uh, uh, using um, uh, stems in all primaries. Um, uh, we know there are some uh, uh, prothesis that may need stem extension into the metaphyseal part and we know that there are mobile uh, uh, bearing surfaces that have higher incidences of uh, uh, wear and possibly instability and early loosening. And that's why it differs uh, depending on the type of implant that you will be using. Cementation. This is um, uh, one thing that perhaps we should highlight during this presentation because when I ask many of orthopedic surgeons uh, how many bags of bone cement you would use and they say it's once. And why are they using a single pack of bone cement because of the cost and the the dare to use a stem rather than using two packs of bone cement to perform the uh, proper cementation this is um, uh, uh, what we should look at which is bone preserving bone cut so we would have a good fixation at the cortical level as well as good metaphyseal cancellous bone in the proximal part and uh, severe deformance like this is not an indication if i have someone with this uh, uh, bone quality and this trabecular arrangement, what I should focus on is how to perform a good alignment and how to perform a good cementation. So cementation and pressurization of our bone cement into the uh, uh, cancellous bone, in addition to having a, a, a layer of bone cement on the implant, would allow you to have good cement penetration, the optimum cement penetration, three to four millimeter in the trabecular bone on the proximal tibia. And that's what would achieve uh, the necessary stability of the implant. That's what we, we should look at. So severe deformity in itself is not an indication for performing a primary knee with a stem, but rather focused on cementation technique and have a good cement mantle and a good alignment postoperatively. And this will assure the survival of your implant rather than using a, a, a tibial stem in all cases. Uh, as I was saying, in primary knees, the more constraint you will place in your implant, the more likelihood that it will have a higher incidence of uh, uh, postoperative um, um, uh, early failure of the implant. And this has been shown in the NGR data that constrained implants have a higher rate of failure than the primary implant, the BS implant. So when you have someone with a severe deformity, but still good bone quality, and you can balance this knee and achieve the necessary stability, inflection and extension and balance your gaps, this can be adequate to achieve the, um, uh, uh, the primary knee and use a BS insert, despite the fact that the patient had a severe deformity preoperatively. Yet, 
there is a good bone quality and you can achieve a good alignment of your implant and the good cementation technique that will allow this patient to have a successful implant for a long time. Wolf is low. We often forget the basics. Bone is aligned along lines of stress. And when you load the bone, you'll have a better quality bone. So when you stress shield the bone, you'll have loosening of your implant. That is what you should look at. This is a study that looked at the relation between the length of the stem and the degree of offloading of the proximal tibia. The longer the stem, the longer the stem, the more offloading is happening on the proximal tibia and the more stress shielding is there. So the blue areas are the areas that is in stress shielding. It's not loaded. While the black and red are the areas when there is high stresses. And when there is high stress, you may end up having preosteal reaction and diaphyseal pain in many of these patients. So addition of a short stem was examined whether it adds to limiting the micromotion that happens at the tibial tray bone interface. But it was found that it doesn't add much to the stability of the interface in terms of micromotion. It would only prevent the tilting of the tibial tray when it is eccentrically loaded. And when there is eccentric loaded, you can perhaps have a, a stem to help you, but you have achieved a good alignment. You wouldn't need to, to worry about this. And I, I, I'm just looking at cases that happens nowadays in this country, looking at the stem that's being used in many primary needs. I just would like to remind you that using a stem, it's not risk-free. And there are many complications that may be related to the use of the stem. It's not risk-free. It's not an additional step that wouldn't cause any problem. And uh, you can see many unjustified indications. We can perhaps debate whether this would need a unicompartmental or a total knee replacement. But I don't think we should consider looking at a stem because it doesn't prevent from other complications that may happen. What we have to teach our registrars and trainees is to perform a good alignment and good cementation technique rather than using a stem in every primary. Now, I'm going to hint on primary knees that may need the use of the stem. We have patients with metaphyseal defects. In these cases, we try to load the metaphysis so we can use cones and stems to support our primary implants in severely osteoporotic patients. We have other patients with severe deformities and bone defects that we may use metal augments to support the tibial tray. And this is when an indication for a stem may come. Can you just have a minute, please? So what we have to differentiate is, are we dealing with a primary knee or a complex primary knee? Because in an obese patient with a, a, a bone defect, you may use, and you are justified to use, a stem, but not in every primary knee. We shouldn't compare apples to oranges, because simply there is what's called the standard primary total knee and the complex primary. And in the complex primary, perhaps there is an indication for using a, a tibial stem rather than being a standard procedure that's being used in, in, in every patient. At the end, I would like to just summarize that we have to, to differentiate between patients with primary knee, we need to perform good alignment and good uh, uh, cementation, and others with complex primary when a stem may be indicated. And uh, I would finish with uh, the say, um, if a wooden fence would do, why would I build a wall of bricks? And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>